Hello and welcome to Biofilm Podcast, a show that brings you to the forefront of biomedical research, biotech, pharma and healthcare fields and the professionals behind it. I'm your host, Pavel Rizhov. My guest today is Luz Marina Minigin, one of my former co-workers at SBP Medical Discovery Institute and now a downstream manufacturing scientist with Abzina. Her resilience and dedication to her craft has helped her scientific as well as personal journey. She is also a mom of one of the most adorable toddlers, Rita. In this episode, you will learn how she balances the work and personal life, and navigates the challenges that the wrench, also known as coronavirus, throws down her way. Welcome to the podcast, Luz. Hello. <laughs> so before we jump into your journey, I'd like to say thank you so much for taking your time out of your crazy busy schedule to speak with me today. Since it's the beginning of the morning, I'm probably stealing some of the precious hours away from your second full job of uh, ma- managing, managing Rita. <laughs> so I, I hope what would be a recurring segment on the podcast, I want to ask you the first question is, what was the last movie you watched or a TV show? Or in your case, like, do you even have a chance to watch something these days? Uh, I think the last thing I watched was Game of Thrones. Um, oh, wow. That's been a minute. Yeah, basically, once she was born, I didn't have time. You know, you, you choose to just sleep and, and then you're awake doing something. Uh, I think there was... Maybe I watched like five minutes of Tiger King. Oh, but then yeah. it was really, it was like in the middle of an episode and it was weird. And I just, I, I, there was no context. And so I didn't know if it was like actually them or, um, or like it was like a, a reenactment with an exaggeration. And then eventually my husband told me that that's just them. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Tiger King, I, uh, I gave it a shot for like exactly 20 minutes and I was like, I cannot believe that something like this exists and I don't yeah. need to traumatize my mind any further. So I was like, I decided to put on a pause. I'm guessing yeah. you didn't show that to Rita too, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think she's not quite ready for that. But hey, that's America. <laughs> <laughs> she so, did watch Joker, I guess, but I mean, she was like three months old, so... I mean, that's, you know, you gotta, you gotta learn that kind of story too. So that's, I mean, anyway, <laughs> so I've, I've known you for about three years and since we started working in our laboratory and I was always impressed by your just immaculate due diligence in terms of taking care of your lab book and really writing down everything. And, but I think it's one of the most really important qualities in the position that you are occupying currently, right? The writing down all the protocols with the exact specifications and things like that. So we always like that. And uh, how did it maybe start for you, this kind of very meticulous approach to, to doing lab work? Um, I think when I started, I had really good training. So I started as um, uh, undergraduate research, and then I worked as a technician uh, at Tufts University for about two years. And then after that, I went to graduate school. Um, where I was there for about five years at UC Irvine, and then I I then moved to the postdoc where I worked with you for three years. Um, and uh, in that whole process, uh, you know, I had really good training for um, so for my undergrad, I had like a graduate student, um, and then for when I was a technician, I was kind of left alone, but I still had like a postdoc that was kind of like overseeing me. And the biggest thing that I learned in the process was that because in each step, I kind of um, was new at the process like I didn't know how to do protein purification I didn't know how to work with fruit flies I didn't know how to do you know fly genetics or whatever the case was having a good notebook allowed me to basically um, you know like write down like where do I even find the items so that if I ever had to repeat it again like I I can actually like retrace my steps and then on top of it um, I've always had to be stuck troubleshooting something and Mm -hmm. part of the problem of troubleshooting is that if if there was no record keeping good record record keeping like you would never be able to repeat those good results that you had Mm -hmm. and and sometimes troubleshooting meant that you had to read other people's notebooks and the frustration for me always lied when I had to read someone else's notebook and I had to like search through five different notebooks to get like one tiny piece of information and uh and so uh and then on top of it my uh a lot of the people who trained me um you know they really emphasized that I had like a good laboratory notebook and even like my PI for graduate school uh, one thing that he made me do was actually like a table of contents. So like the first three pages of my notebook would have to be like specifying every single page 
um, what is contained so that you didn't have to read an entire notebook to find the information. Um, and then I guess I like post it. So then I, I up that by then having like a post it on like the page where if you really needed something that was important that you knew that it worked and you want to use it as a protocol, then I just put a post it on it so that you just mm -hmm. knew, oh, okay, this is where you find all the data for it. So, yeah. So between uh, between writing down uh, things in the lab notebook with a pen versus taking notes on the computer, I guess maybe I was always uh, trying to push myself towards doing the electronic version at the expense of actually having a proper lab book. So what was your sort of, ch what, did you have the same kind of challenge or you just always preferred the writing stuff with pen? Um, I guess I like writing things with pen, but like certain protocols, like whenever you have to do like um, protein expression of the same protein that you've always done, you know, then I would probably like type up a protocol on the computer and then, you know, that protocol basically doesn't change. And then I would paste that into my notebook. And then as I'm writing, as I'm going through the process, if something changed from that protocol, then I just had to scratch it out and say, oh no, instead of 35 minutes, instead of 30 minutes, it was actually 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. so. so in academic setting, obviously you have this freedom to choose sort of the medium to an extent the medium of, with which you collect these sort of types of notes. But what about in the industry? Like how much of that process for you really changed when you, when you, when you uh, joined the uh, Abzen? Um, so I guess, um, so what I do now in my position is that I work in the uh, MSAT department, which stands for Manufacturing Science and Technology. And basically what my role is, is that I take, um, I take a process that process development is a department that basically they're kind of like they're scientists who are on the bench and they basically take like a, like any process of protein purification and they basically have to figure out what is the best way to scale up because you know what we do in an academic setting is that we tend to do it at about you know maybe a two liter scale being you know a big reaction but i need to be able to translate that to the 2000 liter scale so for example size exclusion chromatography would no longer work for us because we can only do uh one percent loading um and then you know you can imagine how many cycles you would have to go through just to be able to do size exclusion. Yeah. However, with ion exchange or cation exchange, sometimes we can take advantage of the charge of the protein where instead of it just binding onto the resin and eluding, but instead you use that as a flow through mode where your protein flows through, but everything else is, um, everything else binds on. And so um, in terms of like experiments, I'm not the one doing the experiments. However, in terms of good record keeping, it's the um, I rely on the PD department's good record keeping so that I can take that information on how to purify the protein and what were things that they needed to troubleshoot. And I have to basically translate that to the manufacturing scale. And so now more than ever, good record keeping is important. Um, but uh, but it's but in terms of uh, and then for the manufacturing team, because it's a GMP environment, good record keeping is like standard. Like you yeah. cannot, um, you know, every little thing is documented. You know, um, what lot number did you use? What bottle did you use? Um, you know, what's the associated part number to that in our internal system? So mm. you know, um, what pipette do you use? Um, when, when was it last calibrated? All yeah, of that information yeah. has to be uh, recorded. So um, now more than ever, it's even more essential. So is this more uh, done with electronic type of uh, you know, record keeping or still there's quite a lot of pen writing? There's a lot of pen writing um, because, uh, so for example, for my position, I write the protocols that the manufacturing team has to execute mm -hmm. and, um, and they can't really deviate from what I have, uh, from what I wrote. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to give them a laptop that they have to take to a clean room. Right. Like it's better to have pen and paper that they can take into the clean room. They also have very little bench space. You know, they just have to do the job. So for them, it makes sense to just have pen and paper. But then we always scan it. And then we have that as like our internal documentation. system. Mm -hmm. 
So the scientific career that you have chosen and, and now that you've gravitated to the industry, what was the, uh, beh- uh, what was the main motivation for you to become a scientist? I know for myself, it's being very curious about protein structure, for example, but what was your sort of defining moment, if you will? Like in my early career? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, um, when I was in undergrad, um, you know, I, you know, I came from a background that I was the first one in my gen- in my family to ever go to college, and um, and so I, you know, I had no, I knew that I had to go to college, but I didn't really think about like what exactly you would do after college, mm-hmm. and um, I knew that I liked uh, helping people. So at the time, I was thinking of wanting to do like medical school because that was the only thing that I I understood. I didn't know that there was a scientist. Or, or a researcher mm-hmm. career and um, but as I started going through undergraduate I just realized that I don't really want to go to medical school but I don't know what else I can do and so I spoke to one of my teachers uh, one of my professors who every time in our lectures she kept saying like I did this I did that and I'm like what do you mean you did that like did you actually do that experiment and she'd be like yeah I did like that's how I discovered it I'm like oh you could do that and so then I volunteered in her lab for a period of time and uh, I really liked it and I just kind of stayed in the lab since. Um, and I think what I like about it that I think fits well with my personality is that um, if there's a problem, I want to be able to solve it and I want to be like, you know, part of the solution. And, um, and I think what I felt was nice about a career in research is that if, if there's a, a drug or a therapeutic that currently doesn't exist, I could be a part of that solution to create, to mm-hmm. create a new therapeutic line. Yeah. So in the, obviously we know in science, the, 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 big, the, the big thing that maybe I struggle with is in terms of identity as a scientist is you're part of a much, much bigger um, sort of group of people that ultimately would bring these types of drugs to the market. So on top of doing um, uh, to troubleshooting, and this is what maybe the most the main motivator that kept you going through these years, uh, how did you sort of uh, differentiate that from um, uh, your just maybe desire to really just jump in and to actually be the sole solution to the problem? Like, well, did you have these kinds of like struggles in your mind as you were going through your grad school, for example? Um. I mean, I think everybody wants to be, I, I definitely had the, the, um, the struggle in graduate school of wanting to be the sole solution. But I think as I started going through graduate school more and more, you know, I would come up with so many ideas on how my project should go, but you're just limited on the, the amount of time in a day that you can actually do all those experiments that you would like to do. Mm-hmm. And having an undergraduate uh, help me out, I think, made me realize that the more people who work on uh, the project, the more uh, reach you can actually have at being able to, to succeed in that project. And so I think more and more, I just realized that, you know, the more people that you have working with you, it's actually better because also you exchange ideas more, you know, you're not really like stuck in a bubble. Um, and, uh, and then on top of it, it's collaborative. So like, you know, uh, I also just enjoy my day a lot more because, you know, sometimes just having a, a conversation about, you know, how we're going to optimize a certain assay over coffee was, you know, something that was pleasant, but also at the same time, um, you know, um, informative and collaborative. And, and so I think that combination is really what helps me. Yeah. So the, the troubleshooting aspect of being a scientist and just being a scientist is, I think, still a little general, but and that's why a lot of people, you know, PhDs and postdocs, they often struggle uh, for, for, in terms of their transition to the industry because oftentimes what they have been doing for the past, you know, for the duration of their grad school and postdoc, they don't often know what exactly they want to do in quote unquote real world. So did you experience this type of identity crisis and how did you overcome it when you were, do, when you were in this uh, transitional period? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so I think I very early in, well, not early, but like towards the end of my PhD, I, I started thinking about like, what if I don't become a professor, you know, what else would I do if it's industry, if it's nonprofit, if it's, you know, a for profit. And, um, and then, uh, the biggest thing that I did was just do informational interviews. And through that process, I think um, you discover a little bit more about yourself in the sense of like, you know, 
uh, if you interviewed someone and they said, oh, you know, the best part about my job is that I get to still do bench work and I don't have to sit down and write grants. And you're like, well, I don't mind writing grants. Uh, you know, maybe that's one thing. Or you find out like, oh, um, I, uh, all I do is talk to clients because, you know, in patent law, you have to be able to translate the, you know, the, um, uh, you have to be able to translate the science to a natural commercial setting and then the legal aspects of protecting that uh, information, you know, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't even realize that that's something that existed. And so by the time that I, I still wanted to do a postdoc because I felt like there were certain techniques that I was lacking that I thought would make me stronger in industry as a scientist um, because I, I had some protein purification experience, but I still wanted to like strengthen um, a lot of the chromatography and, uh, and structural biology aspects of my training. And so I purposely chose a postdoc with the idea that after, you know, two years or three years that I would, you know, end it and I would look for a job. And um, for me, that's actually what worked out because since I knew that I had like a drop dead date that I had to, you know, finish by, um, one is that it kept me focused on the research. And two is that while I was an SBP, I was part of the uh, postdoc association and I took advantage of the resources that I had uh, in terms of funding and uh, the network of people that have been part of the postdoc association. So, you know, uh, one of the uh, events that I organized out of my own um, you know, out of my own interest, but I knew that other postdocs had the same thing was actually to uh, the same interest was to organize a career day where I contacted people from like different career options. So like regulatory affairs, patent law, um, people who work in industry, but even within industry, you know, that meant business development versus a scientist position versus process development, um, you know, so different aspects of the of the commercial process. and. Um, and then people who were interested in writing or medical writing and uh, and basically i got them onto a room having a panel session and uh and through that it's like having an informational interview people come to you and you get to you know have questions that you can that you can get answered mm -hmm. and um i think it was not something that i decided immediately oh i knew that this is exactly what i want to do and this is what i pursued um, but it was more like a process of elimination that I knew, okay, for sure, I don't want to do that. For sure, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But these are still my, my array of options. And so even when I was applying for this position uh, for the, well, actually, I was applying for a process development position. So I was learning to scale up a process because that's more, um, you know, more of a direct translation of what we already do as a postdoc is that you're already sitting in the lab bench, you're already thinking about how you can optimize a process uh, in terms of protein purifications, increasing the yields, lowering the cost. Um, so the, the process development was already kind of like a natural uh, move forward. Um, at the same time, I was also looking for, you know, a patent office position. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and I was studying also for the patent, you know, patent bar exam. So, um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing for me is that I didn't limit myself to any one career track. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, informational interviews and specifically, you know, for scientists, it's often we tend to get a bit shy and maybe a little socially awkward. And I don't mean to generalize here, but I think doing this informational interviews is something, as, as you just said, it helped you quite a bit to, uh, trying to eliminate some of those things. So how did you really go about finding the people and uh, having these kinds of conversations with them also what was the process like um i think the biggest thing is linkedin and uh you know more people than you think you do um so as soon as you go into linkedin um uh you know i would look at like old graduate students uh, old postdocs, even people who I've never met, but like maybe we have like some type of mutual connection, like we both went to UCI or we both know a certain professor, or we both know a certain person. And I would just uh, message them saying, hi, you know, I'm a postdoc at SPP, you know, I'm interested in a career in so-and-so, you know, do you have a moment to, you know, to chat, whether it's on Skype or, or coffee? And, you know, I just kept it very light. Um, and surprisingly, most people were very responsive. Um, 
even people that like there was no mutual connection like i just you know that was the only regulatory affair person that i knew mm -hmm. i would contact them and uh, most of the times people got back to me because i think everybody has been in that position where they don't know and uh, and they don't know where to start mm -hmm. for sure so the transitional period that you had really took you quite quite a long time but also in the midst of it you also became a mom so instead of asking like oh how how challenging it must have been to juggle all those things in terms of you know dealing with the toddler pregnancy and then ultimately looking for a job instead I, i'm very curious how do you think rita actually helped you to you know to be in a position that you're in to sort of um, overcome these challenges that you faced over these last few months um that's a very good question. So uh, I think how Rita helps me is that I can't waste time. Time is really precious. So if I know that her nap is half an hour, I think what can I accomplish? What can be my maximum impact in half an hour? Mm -hmm. And you know maybe that's uh, you know uh, polishing a resume. Maybe it's uh, you know sending out a few emails and invites to to talk to people. Maybe it's uh, finishing a course online. Um, but uh, I I just learned to kind of break everything up into half hour segments and uh and you just you just prioritize you immediately are prioritizing your what you need to do i think in your career right now uh in your, in your position from what you told me um off air i think yeah that's the time prioritization and just re really learning a lot of things at the same time and just overcoming this barrier of new information i think this type of preparation that you just explained, I think really helped. I think that's kind of the, the key uh, learning experience that you had to have in order to really be successful in the job that you have right now. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was also very curious. So one of the questions that um, uh, our mutual friend Chandan requested me to ask, and I'm obviously also curious about it myself, maybe we'll, we'll start to have some audience questions as time goes on, is uh, uh, what do you think about a uh, four-week maternity leave? Like, is this enough? How much, how much time do you think is required for, for this type of um, you know, experience to be you know, enough and to have, you know, so what are your thoughts on the maternity leave aspects uh, of, of, in terms of your experience? Well, I think I was extremely lucky. Um, so how it worked for me is that California provides, um, I think it's 12 weeks of maternity leave, including four weeks before the pregnancy itself, or before the, not the pregnancy, before the, uh, you know, giving birth. So I took two weeks off right before giving birth. The next day, Rita was born. And, um, and then, um, and then I had the luxury of having the 12 weeks maternity leave by California. Um, it happened to be that the timing worked out that it was then Christmas and the holiday season. So uh, I got to kind of extend it a bit extra. And I think that's also, you know, I'm also extremely thankful that Francesca, who was my PI at the time, was very understanding to extend my maternity leave a little bit longer. Um, you know, honestly, every week counts. And, um, and then in January, when I had to come back, um, um, I worked for about a week. Uh, during that entire time of maternity leave, I was applying to post, I was applying for positions, uh, even before uh, I was applying for positions and I was getting interviews. And, um, and basically by the time I came back to, to start the postdoc again, um, I got the job offer. And so then I went back to stay with Rita for another two weeks and then I started. So the reality is I, I was very blessed that I had about six months with her um, at the end before I started working. And I think that that was just the perfect amount of time. Yeah. Um, because after that, I didn't feel so, you know, I'm, I was also breastfeeding at the time, or I guess I still am. And, um, and that was really, um, it's just really hard to do while working at the same time, while starting a new job. And I think at least certain things got established. And, uh, and so then it was just a matter of continuing the, the, the routine that I already established for myself while still taking on a new position. Yeah, I think uh, you having a kid last year versus some, for example, now is such a blessing that, you know, it's kind of, it cannot be probably understated just how much the timing was right on, on your part. And I didn't plan it at all. It just really worked out. It couldn't have been any more smooth. And yeah. I'm super lucky, but I know that 
you know, unfortunately, that's not the case for everybody. Yeah. Um, so and in, I hope that that changes. Yeah. In, in this time of uh, social isolation and obviously the, the, co the COVID-19 crisis that we all have to deal with, what were your sort of the main highlights in terms of your professional uh, changes and experiences that you go through in your job as well as on the personal side? How did, the, how did your life really change in these last two months? Um, so I'm very lucky that I would say maybe 80% of my job I can do from home, but because, um, our company is, you know, the, how they make Renovue is by manufacturing. So we manufacture antibodies that are used often for, um, uh, stage one clinical trials. And, uh, and so our manufacturing team is really the bread and butter of our company to be able to, to create Renovue. And my role is to support the manufacturing team. And my role is also to, when they're doing the manufacturing run, I'm on the floor with them so that if there's any problems, I'm the one that's troubleshooting. So, you know, it means that 80% of my job is me planning out the experiment, planning out what they're gonna do, writing the protocols, getting all the documentation ready for them for that run, for that campaign. Um, and uh, the 20% is me going on site to help the manufacturing team, whether it's looking for the logistics of where are we gonna store solutions and buffers when you're working on a 2000 meter scale, or um, if it's a matter of, um, you know, being there for the operators when they have to actually um, troubleshoot something, you know, you just can't do it on the phone. Like you need to actually stand there and look at the equipment and then troubleshoot what, what to do. And so um, the how COVID kind of changed for us uh, or for me is that it meant that um, I have to be much more flexible with my time. So uh, sometimes that means that I only go in for two hours and then I come back and then I work. Sometimes it means that I just work odd hours uh, because the reality is also that because of COVID, I don't have childcare. And so it's my husband and I that are kind of switching off and he's also a uh, PhD and he's, he's a scientist as well, not in biology and in physics, but uh, you know, he had grants to do. And so, you know, we basically coordinate our schedule. And so, sometimes mornings so like next week i'll have to do training session with the manufacturing team and so for the mornings i'll be busy and then the afternoons i take care of rita and then you know in between naps and the evenings or early morning is when i actually work so it's kind yeah. of off the ball at this point so kind of circling back to maybe what we were discussing a moment ago about time management i think having a kid really te teaches you how to how to manage your time very, very well and prepares you for things like COVID, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, but it also, you know, um, for some aspects, it also has disrupted the, the distinct, distinction of uh, work life because work and life are just intertwined and mixed at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a meeting, sometimes I'll have a meeting with my boss or with my team members or with a client. And unfortunately, Rita has to be with me. And so they have to hear her in the background. Mm -hmm. And, um, there, you know, there's, you can't really explain to uh, a nine month year old to be quiet. You know, she doesn't understand. Yeah. So it's just a, a lot of muting and then waiting for the optimal moment where uh, she's not screaming or making sounds to, you know, turn on the mic and respond and say something and then, you know, immediately mute it back. Yeah. So overall, in, as we wrap up our discussion on in this podcast episode, the experience that you had from the undergrad to grad to postdoc to now a scientist in the industry, the most, I think, interesting part about this journey for you, I think, was the discovery of who you want to become as well as leveraging your strengths as a communicator, as well as, you know, this due diligence when it comes to, you know, just doing science and really be passionate about troubleshooting. What was the maybe experience that was very important that sticks in your mind and maybe something you can share with our audience, some of them who may be also trying to transition into the industry? What sort of helped you in your journey? To acquire to, my position? Or? Yeah, to acquire, to acquire your position and sort of to just uh, be as successful as you are now. I think what was the, the most important thing that you think our listeners would appreciate in terms of like a skill or an experience that you want to have 
in your professional career that may help you to get to where you want to be? Um, I think for me, it's being flexible and networking. I mean, um, just the more and more that I talk to people about what they do, whether it came from informational interviews from former colleagues that I had, um, you learn more about different positions that are available that it's not just a scientist position. It could also be, you know, uh, like NSAID is something I never understood. I, I never knew what that position was, but it was only once I went through the interview process that I then realized that actually this is the perfect position for me because I get to talk to clients. I get to talk to the QA department. I get to learn, uh, I get to work with the manufacturing team and I'm the technical expert when it comes to a specific, uh, you know, process. And, uh, it's something that, um, I now realize like how much my, uh, my skills were, you know, uh, translational. Uh, that mm -hmm. you can translate many of my the skills that you do as a postdoc in graduate school and you can translate it to industry. Um, and a lot of it is just understanding what are your strengths and yeah. working with that. Yeah, that is, that's such a good advice. And uh, I speaking personally, like I actually just a was asking the same question of myself, like what are my strengths? What can I leverage in my career search right now? And what would be uh, the way that I can apply them. So I think that's understanding your strengths is something super important in this uh, period where maybe some of us are not just struggling with like identity crisis, but also like, where do we go in this terms of in, in this, uh, you know, post COVID world, like what, what's this, how do we alleviate this uncertainty? So I think that's a really good advice. So thank you so much, Luz, for taking your time to speak with us today. I hope that you will have all the success in the world when it comes to your, uh, your job position, as well as raising a beautiful child. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you.